Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dan Winnegan with another episode with you. Uh, today, I have a very special guest. Um, he is uh, I, uh, he is an attorney in California working in the uh, CBD and alcohol distribution industry. Uh, he's also been a real estate broker uh, since 2012 and um, has worked both in the real estate industry for both uh, uh, cannabis and on, on the legal side. So uh, let me welcome Danny Weiss. Hi, Dan. How's everything? Hey, I'm good. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on the show. I'm very excited to have a conversation with you um, because this has, as you know, probably been a, a pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty hot and pretty complex uh, area, especially on the legal side. But you've kind of been around the block for a little bit. So I want to talk to you about some of the things that you've seen um, working with, uh, you know, cannabis clients in this industry. Yeah. Um, for sure. I mean, we've been working within the cannabis space for the last five years and the hemp industry has started to sort of um, run parallel with the cannabis industry. So starting out of the gate, you had a lot of cannabis companies um, and now the hemp industry is starting to play catch up a little bit. And since it's a lot more easier to sell units nationwide um, from a brand perspective, um, within the hemp space, the cannabis industry has, you know, um, it's almost been like an organic sort of transition over, and the industries are starting to really like intersect. And, you know, there's um, a lot of brands that are bringing out products that are THC infused, um, beverage lines, um, infused lotions, uh, pretty much anything, any product that you could name, you could actually market it within the hemp space and reach a wider market coast to coast um, versus, you know, cannabis is very uh, work intensive in terms of getting, you know, licensed and, um, you know, complying with all the regulations because they're a lot stricter. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So to talk a little bit about, you know, cause I do know uh, all those things come from the same plant, right? So they can extract, if you can correct me from, they can extract the hemp, and extract the THC, and extract, you know, uh, some things. And that's why, uh, you know, way well, many years ago, hemp was, you know, mostly or legal in some places because it wasn't used for, you know, for sure. what we know as today is what most people use the plants for. But can you talk yeah. a little bit about, you know, what, what types of products or things can come out of, of this particular plant? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I think there's a documentary out there um, on Netflix, I believe, called you know the explained they're kind of like a mini docu-series and they have this cannabis explained sort of mm. 20 minute um this is the history of cannabis this is where it came from now this is where we're at but they do such a good job of uh, creating like a visual telling the story visually and making it like like within 20 minutes you're like oh you know it makes a, it makes a lot of sense so cannabis specifically um and Dave can speak more to like the legal aspect. He's not here today, mm -hmm. but um, if legally, if a product contains 0.03% THC or more, then it, most states it's not legal, mm -hmm. and federally it hasn't been descheduled. So if it's a 0.04 THC content in a particular strain, then that product needs to be either mitigated or remediated to get that percentage down so that it's now compliant within the hemp space. Um, uh, as far as what plants that they come from, so when you talk about THC or you talk about, you know, talk, people talk about CBD mm -hmm. a lot, like within, mm -hmm. within um, you know, a hemp product and the, the value of um, CBD for that particular product. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, those um, are just kind of like the quick go-to terms that people use to talk about the compounds that are being associated within that product. But um, CBD itself um, is only one single cannabinoid out of, uh, there's over a hundred cannabinoids that um, come in the various strains of cannabis and hemp plants. And so um, each one of those cannabinoid co compounds has different health benefits. Like there's some, some of them, can be used like a Viagra. There's uh, some of them that um, can be used as a diet pill 
I, I believe it's like THCV or something. I'm, I'm not a scientist by any stretch, but all I know is what I know from, you know, my, my experiences with the clients that we have within the space. Um, we have uh, THC itself. It, it comes up in a lot of hemp strains, but also um, generally cannabis. Uh, when you're talking cannabis, you're talking, and I'm, I'm not a cultivator, but from what I understand, um, cannabis is generally more of, you're talking about the female plants mm. of a particular strain. And then generally the hemp is the male counterpart mm. and it, they grow differently. Um, most of the male strains don't, they don't flower the same way. Mm. So you're not going to get, they don't look exactly the same either. And they're not grown the same. I mean, you can just take a handful of hemp seeds, throw it in the ground in the middle of nowhere. And then that plant's just going to start growing. But on the cannabis side, it takes very careful attention to get that beautiful fat nug that people are, are now buying in the stores. And so um, totally different growing procedures, processes, and um, every single strain and every single hybrid and every single plant sometimes can have varying levels of these various cannabinoids that are in them. So um, sometimes it, it pays to pay careful attention to the uh, amount of the particular cannabinoid comp compound that is in the product, um, the amount of CBD or CBN mm. or CB, you know, just, I mean, there's some of the, the compounds don't even have names. It's mm. pretty great. It's pretty crazy. If like somebody wanted to just go out there and start doing R and D on, on new cannabinoid compounds that haven't even been like fully researched because people don't even know really the extent of what this, the, the plant on either side can really do. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, um, generally though, when you're in a dispensary, um, they call it cannabis derived products. Mm. So anything that's like being regulated by the state of California. Um, and when you walk into a, a medical or adult use dispensary, you're going to have, you're going to have these products and they are supposed to have been derived directly from a cannabis plant, mm. even though the same cannabinoid camp compound can be technically extracted from a hemp plant. You know, there's, I mean, there's small amounts of THC in that you can create the same product with both yeah. plants. There, there are some people that would um, beg to differ um, in that where they, they will kind of laud the, uh, the, uh, that there's just some sort of additional benefit to it being mm. cannabis derived versus hemp derived. Okay. And yeah. so, and I, I, I think though, like, I'm not a scientist though. I mean, I'm, if I see a compound, you know, maybe it doesn't, maybe this brand of Tylenol doesn't hit me as good as this brand of Tylenol, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but they both have the same like chemical compounds in within the, within the product. So I don't, I, I don't know. It just doesn't really make sense that a cannabis derived product would be better. So sorry, I'm, I'm totally like <laughs> no, <laughs> shooting well, out the side, but. Well, I know, I mean, um, you know, you talked about, uh, uh, in most states, you know, if it's over a certain percentage that it, it's illegal. Um, are, now, are there labs set up for testing? And then are those, are those labs like sanctioned by the state, licensed by the state? Um, like for, for people who want to bring a new product to the market, do they have to go to these particular labs that run these certification reports or anything? No, I mean, generally every state, um, the federal government has basically said, okay, it's descheduled. Yeah. Yeah. States, you guys do. Like, do whatever you want. Um, some of them, like uh, the state of Idaho, for instance, where I'm, that's my home state, um, they have a 0.0% .0 THC allowance. And there are a few extract labs in like Oregon, Colorado, where they have the, um, the equipment that can actually get you that 0.0% .0 THC. Mm. But generally, every single hemp plant and every single cannabis plant has THC in it. Right. on some level you yeah. know so getting it to 0, 0.0 is, is more difficult um as far as the lab testing facilities um most of the labs are are testing both cannabis and hemp products mm -hmm. um but right now uh since hemp sort of it, well in our home state in cali mm -hmm. um cannabis regulations came out before hemp like so hemp was just being grown um there were some cities that were like already allowing because I mean people have been using hemp for a product a lot of right. different products you know right. paper for a long time you know it's not this isn't new 
But I mean, I think the states are just now seeing since it's descheduled and people are paying attention. Now they have opportunity to take uh, the tax incentive, you know, yeah. they, they can tax on it. And yeah. that's really what it comes down to. So ever um, since you, ever since you've, um, you know, seen the, the, it become legal, especially in California. What are some of the business trends you, you've seen? In? Is, is big money trying to get in? Are, are, are the people who are doing it illegally now trying to go legal? Are new players like they've never stepped into the space before? Are they trying to get in? Yeah, so um, I think the people who knew what was coming down the line um, five years ago, the, they were sort of like the early adopters, you know, mm -hmm. they were the first movers in space. And, um, and they're, so right now in our home state, Cali, mm -hmm. they, uh, there is a moratorium, which, which restricts the size of an actual grow operation mm -hmm. that can actually be, um, that can actually be built out and, and operated. Um, and that, the size of that um, for indoor is 22,000 square feet. Um, a big company like Philip Morris, you know, they can't do anything with that unless yeah. they set up a hundred, you know, little yeah. 22,000 square foot, you know, companies under different LLCs and where to get really um, creative, but it would take, it would be like a lot of work that would not necessarily um, have the return that they probably be looking for because yeah. they're already making money hand, hand over fist in, within their current industries. Right. And for, for the, a lot of the big corporations, they don't have, they, they have endless amounts of money, you know, yeah. but that, I just saw an article um, that Marlboro is now in the game. Philip Morris is now, they're, they're in the cannabis game. But to be honest, like four or five years ago, they already had purchased 800,000 acres of land up in Humboldt and they were just sitting on it. They're just, once the moratorium drops in 2023, the big guys are going to come in and swallow up every single person in the entire room. And so that's, that's the reality. So, um, so, so I mean, so, so that, that means, uh, so, so 2023 is th three years, less than three years from now. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you can, and when you say swallow up, meaning is it kind of like sell to us at a cheap rate or we're going to put you at a business type deal or let us acquire you because you already have the infrastructure that we really? need is faster. All of, all of that, all, all of that. And all of it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. One of the largest alcohol distributors. And I'm talking about, um, and this is on the cannabis side, but mm -hmm. on the hemp side, I mean, Coca-Cola <laughs> is uh, and Constellation brands. They have massive um, uh, facilities, R&D facilities that they set up in New York state. And I mean, Coca-Cola is, I think they put aside 500 million dollars just for hemp research just for cbd beverage research and honestly i mean in, in terms of uh, from a consumer standpoint a beverage is like the easiest and most familiar way that people will probably be consuming anything within the cannabis or hemp um product sort of uh within that space you, you, you think do you think the beverage, because I know they took Four loco off the, off the, off the market, right? Yeah. And that was basically mm -hmm. soda and alcohol. But, <laughs> you'll, yeah. Yeah. but you'll, you'll, you'll see something like, um, you know, uh, uh, THC or CBD uh, infused uh, uh, drinks available, you know, in the near oh, future. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're researching it because there's not a lot of research in either space. Yeah. Not a lot of, you know, um, and, but now every single major university now has a cannabis sort of um, uh, department. You know, mm -hmm. all the UC, all the University of California schools, they all have a cannabis department in some way. Um, UCI was the first one actually. And, um, and I mean, you have Cornell up in upstate New York mm -hmm. and they have, they, they're doing a massive push for hemp research um, and working with a lot of the growers out there. Cause I mean, north of, I mean, the entire state is north of New York City, right. but it's all agrarian. I mean, you got, I was, I was driving through from uh, New York City to Albany and then past Albany up to Buffalo um, mm -hmm. last February. And I mean, no cell phone service for like 20 miles at a time. And I mean, there's like Quakers out there and uh, on the, um, there's Amish settlements. It's, it's pretty nuts. You know? <laughs> it's, I mean, we don't, we're, we don't have that out here. Yeah. Know, just, yeah. But uh it's really interesting but okay. yeah there's a big push for it out in new york for sure okay so i know you know you work with a lot of um uh, uh 
uh, CPD businesses and setting up retail shops and setting up distributions. So what, what are maybe they're your top three things, three things that, you know, someone who is looking to get into this space, what do they really need to know about, you know, this business? So if they're going to set up a CBD business, I mean, I guess it just depends on what type of business that they're looking mm-hmm. to do. I guess try to figure it out if it's going to be a B2B mm-hmm. type of a business or B2C. So where, if, where are you finding the selling- most? Yeah. So in between those two, where are you fi- where are you seeing like the most opportunities? Where are most people attracted to? Because obviously there might be more money in one place or the other. Uh, there, as far as, um, I mean, it really just comes down to the business and the business right. model and the business yeah. owner. Yeah. Really, it's it's. But if you can create a well branded product, I think that's where. Um, you can make some real money. I mean, yeah. the, the thing about it is I'm say, setting up a company that extracts oil. You're always, or that, you know, creates this number of, you know, this number of units of CBD lotion. You know, uh, you're always going to be capped out. Um, if you're do- going wholesale, you don't have a brand. Mm-hmm. So you're always going to be capped on your production and the amount of orders you're getting and the amount of orders that you can fill efficiently. Um, when you have a brand, um, and now that you see bigger business coming into space, Coca-Cola, I mean, if you can, if you can create a CBD beverage that they don't want to do the research on, and you've already figured out the science and made a perfect product, um, then you can sell your brand. You, you, you're definitely going to be able to show like the units that you're, you've been selling um, and what states you're selling in, coast to coast. And then, and then once you get picked up by that big you know, beverage manufacturer, Constellation picks you up. Dude, that's when you make the 10, 20 multiple on, on what you're actually doing. Um, I think brand development is really where, where people are trying to focus now yeah. versus actually having operations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I mean, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, no Nike has like, right. you know, come out and, and revealed itself within the hemp space. Um, I mean, Steezy's doing pretty good. Um, that's pretty uh, pretty recognizable cannabis vape pen brand. Um, there's a, there's a few others, but I mean, there's still I just still don't see a Nike. I still don't see a Gatorade. You know, yeah. it's uh, so I think there's a really a lot of opportunity there if people can create just a knockout. You know, a good product. Yeah, and that's another that's another conversation. You know, I mean. Yeah. Maybe it's a very well marketed, very well branded product, but I mean, who cares what's inside the bottle? Because like the consumer already has, you know, this is like Starbucks coffee. You know, it's not great coffee, but I mean, in terms of like the the quality of the the beans right. that you're actually consuming, but that brand recognition is everything, you know. And uh, if you can do that, that's great. So I know, like I do, I do trademark work, and you know, since it's since it's um, uh, banned at the federal level uh you know at this time we can't we can't get trademarks although there's there's some talk about getting those through are you know you talk about branding has there been even talk at at where on your side of the table like getting trademarks for for some of these uh, things for your clients yeah i mean that's not really what we do yeah um we're more on the business development and licensing side right. um but as far i mean that's exactly what you do and so yeah. Um, that's why you're going to be working on our logo <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. But uh, I, um, I think on the hemp side, though, it has been just scheduled, you know. So yeah. generally, from a federal standpoint, I mean, you can go ahead and try and trademark it as long as it's not a big fat green pot leaf. You know, <laughs> it's like uh-huh. I think generally most people are, are able to kind of push most of the trademarks or you know yeah. whatever they're. Uh, their, their logos or whatever through, um, yeah. Right. So what's, process. so, you know, it sounds like B2B is probably, you know, probably the biggest potential, right? Cause you said, you know, retail space, you still, you still got all that overhead or retail space and employees and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you got the city, you know, you gotta work with the city and all that too. And mm-hmm. whereas B2B you have, you know, people making wholesale orders and, you know, mm. bigger orders. So, um, you know, what, what are the, some, of, what's the next thing that they should know if like, Hey, 
that we want to get into this BDB space. We want to distribute to either another distributor, like, you know, distributor or directly to the retail, um, these retail locations. You know, what else do they need to know about this particular business? So in terms of the hemp space, I mean, the, the distribution space on the cannabis side was, it didn't really exist until just a couple of years ago. Um, it was all, you know, it's, it's kind of like old school cartel style. You know, you had, you had the guy who knew the guy and could get the stuff that you needed. And then that guy just, you know, it was, it was a collective mindset and it has been for decades. Um, now you have a few a handful of distributors that actually came from that era and have been able to, you know, go ahead and translate their business into under the new regulatory scheme. But um, on the hemp side, I did, I have, there's not a lot, you know, there's a, that's a massive opportunity. You know, if, if there are people that just were focusing on hemp and yeah. cannabis product or hemp specific um, distribution in, in whatever markets, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for sure. Um, because if, if you're looking, a lot of it is really just word of mouth and like doing, doing essentially door knocking. You know, right. you're calling all of the CBD retailers or anyone that you can get your products into um, directly and just doing that grunt work um, because that's your only option at this point. You know? Right, right. So you talk, yeah. you know, talk about a little bit uh, about distribution and, you know, they got, the, they got to move these products and mm. the last conversation, you know, actually probably like in sprinter vans and not, not these like Optimus Prime sized, uh, you know, trailers. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, even with that, is there... Can you speak to can you speak to any the security involved? Like, do they have to take extra precautions? Uh, like, um, obviously, they don't mark the mark any of the transportation. But can you mm. can you talk to any uh, to about those precautions? Maybe the B two B business owners take as far as getting their product to where they need to go. Yeah, I mean, as far I mean, if it's a finished product, mm. generally, I mean, people are just using normal mail because mm -hmm. it's not it's not. If it's going across state lines, yeah, I mean, you're, you're not supposed to be right. doing that because every state is supposed to have regulations in place. The thing is, most of the states don't have hemp regulations in place. Mm -hmm. And so, um, technically, people are supposed to be, you know, white labeling within each state, and then they can do in, inter, no, intrastate sort of uh, transportation, so within the state borders. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean... There, I, I think the way most people are really treating it, you know, and I, w I w wouldn't advise this, you know, but um, they're just using, they're treating it like any other product, you know, they're, they're drop shipping it and then letting the existing distribution apparatus just do what it does. Right, right. You know, there's, there's probably billions of, of parcels, you know, circulating mm -hmm. like, so, so it's probably more of a, you know, enforcement issue. Like they don't have enough manpower, especially these days, right? To, to open I mean, up every package. So if you're going to go shut down, you know, grandma who's like sending out a hundred units of CBD lotion, you know, because you care that much, you know, yeah. how much, how much state resources you just spend to, yeah. to put grandma out of business, you know, and yeah. over, over, it's, it's just, I don't know, economically inefficient for them to enforce, you know, yeah. lotion sales. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's funny. So, so maybe, maybe the next thing is, you know, um, since, so, and I know we talked just a little bit about this before the, about the banking system, right? So how, how do these B2B, even if it's just in the state of California, how do these B2B players get paid uh, cash uh, or, you know, Bitcoin, uh, <laughs> the trucks of, uh, <laughs> trucks of wheelbarrows full of, you know, whatever if you're holding yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, all of the above, man. And yeah. most of the uh, most of the CBD companies are, you know, they're banking, you know, okay. and they're they're being banked. If they're, okay. you yeah. you can openly say, I am a hemp, uh, you know, a hemp producer or I'm a, a hemp company, and you're good because um, as long as I mean, if you're a THC, you, most most banks won't take you. There's a there's a few, but um, generally. Uh, especially on a B2B side, the transactions are a lot um, larger, you know, so you're talking anywhere from like five to five to $30,000 for one order, you know, depending on, on the, the volume. And um, I mean, you're not going to just, I mean, some people do, you know, yeah. sort of with $10,000 worth in cash. It's actually not that much money, 
you know, it's like a stack like this big, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not that big of a deal, but I mean, the industry has been dealing with cash for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally speaking, um, yeah, they're, they're just doing it the old, old school, just like everybody else. Yeah. So, um, let's talk, you know, you talk about you, you guys do the licensing, um, for, for these companies talk about the licensing uh, pr- uh, process, how long it's taking, how much it costs, you know, mm-hmm. if they're looking to get into this space. So on the hemp side, I mean, there's only um, a handful of counties. I think on the last I counted, um, as a, a, a six months ago, there were only three counties in the entire state of California that were actually actively licensing CBD for CBD so, so, operations. So, all right. So would that mean that if they wanted to do, do CBD, they would have to go to those particular counties to? If they wanted to do a licensed <laughs> CBD <laughs> operation in California, they mm-hmm. would have to. I think a lot of people were already operating under the the lack of rules mm-hmm. um prior to um california even giving it any attention and so um those those businesses i think i mean they're not looking to shut down those businesses that have already been you know paying yeah. tax paying taxes and and operating for you know five ten years whatever however long they've been open so um I don't really see that it's it's changed a whole lot mm. um, just because the hemp industry in most states is very, it, it's, it's immature. I mean, mm. and the cannabis industry is immature in most states, you know, yeah. I mean, it's the, the only, the, there's only a handful of states where, I mean, the marketplaces really feel like, you know, a very um, well-developed sort of, uh, uh, system, you know, I mean, you have Colorado, you know, Oregon's doing what it's doing, Washington, California, um, Illinois is going to be a good one. You know, we've just finished up base two of Illinois. That one, that one's going to be a fun marketplace to operate within Michigan's kind of, or yeah, Michigan's kind of getting its training wheels off. And so, I mean, we're all in various stages of marketplace development at this point, but, um, I mean, all of that stuff in, for, in terms of actually getting licensed in those counties you know, there, might, there might be five now um, mm-hmm. it's yeah. gonna probably cost depending on I mean you talk to one law firm they're probably they, they'll, they'll try and charge you a hundred thousand dollars you know yeah. but yeah. Um, I mean what we would charge would probably be something in the, uh, the arena of like five thousand to ten thousand depending on how much work would be involved for that to, to acquire that license and then that would just be for the locality and then at the state level, you know, yeah. but um, the, the, the local licensing fees on hemp are much, much uh, cheaper. Hmm. And I mean, I've seen it as low as like 50 bucks in some like jurisdictions, but I mean, that, that's back East. I think it's yeah. like Virginia or something. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like cannabis because cannabis licensing is ridiculous. It's like, it can get, get up to like Costa Mesa where my office is right now. Yeah. Fifty-two thousand dollars just to submit an application, just yeah. to submit. They, they might not even prove you, you know. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's night and day in terms of the licensing um, cost. So yeah, and so yeah. so it sounds like there's kind of two two things to consider is you know the state licensing. Uh, you talk about the city, and then um, maybe even at the county level of, mm-hmm. of being licensed. Like you know, say it, you know they wanted to go into Costa Mesa, even with the fifty-two thousand. What's what's the time frame look like? You know, I mean, it on, just on the average. On, on the av- if you could just on the average, or based on the experiences you've had with either Costa Mesa or different uh, different cities. Um, I mean, Long Beach, like you know, is is very predictable mm-hmm. in terms of the licensing process. Um, I've gotten licenses through in as quick as three months, where the like they were able to get operational. Mm-hmm. But you know, the the building didn't re- require a tremendous build out, so yeah. that was um, that was able to cut down the timeline. As far as, um, as far I mean, I have some clients that have taken two years just because you know they don't have the right team putting everything together. So it's not, um, just comes down to whoever, whoever, whatever team that we're talking to. Yeah. You know? Are we talking to the, you know, the Cleveland Browns or the Forty Nineers? You know? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you know, who, you know, let's talk about teams then. You know what? Mm-hmm. Um, what separates really good teams that can get up and m- running maybe three months mm-hmm. to other places that will take two years and they're not even off the ground yet? So I think you need 
kind of that, uh, that executive partner that's going to really just hammer all the details and make sure they know, okay, this is, this is the steps to get operational. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, if I'm going to just break it down quick and dirty, um, uh, you have to have a place where you're going to operate. So finding that location, uh, making sure that you can get licensed in that jurisdiction, and then going through the licensing process and build out with the city. So that team, when I talk about the team, you need, you know, the guy who's really, you know, leading the, the team, uh, the team of forces, and then you need him. He needs to be in charge of making sure the architect gets the site plans fully prepped and ready as soon as possible. Because the architect, you can live and die on your architect sometimes mm. because yeah. sometimes they're terrible, you know? And how's it important, yeah. important to work with a, an architect that has maybe experience in building out these, because these, these are maybe even more specialized and each city has their own requirements. Mm. Is it, so is it important to work with an architect that maybe is more familiar with what, what is required of these particular businesses? Mm -hmm. One thing I would ask my uh, a potential architect yeah. is like we have the ones that we've wor we've worked with, mm -hmm. and there's like a ton that we don't work with anymore, <laughs> and yeah. it's because they um, they took us too much time, and mm -hmm. time is money in this. Mm -hmm. Every single month that you're not operational, you just that's money you just need to take off the table, throw it in the garbage. So mm -hmm. it, re it really um, to be expedient, it really is going to benefit you uh, your end game. So um, ask. Ask the architect if he can give you, um, give you some, uh, some uh, referrals mm -hmm. of past clients. Um, ask them generally how many, you know, and ask those, those referrals, uh, those references, mm -hmm. uh, how long did it take for him to get the site plans prepared? Um, how many times did the city have to come back with notes? Because generally the code is the code is the code. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the codes change, um, but I need to know um, that the architect actually knows how to read the code and isn't going to be, you know, arguing back and forth with the senior planner at City of Long Beach. Because if you go through that process, it becomes a nightmare. And if you piss off the wrong person, they're the ones who have to review you and stamp approve on your site plan. So that right. can really like bog down the whole process. Um, the only other uh, thing that I would try and, I get from them is um, how responsive are, is yeah. your architect. So call the reference, find out how responsive. Does he get back to you within 24 hours? Mm -hmm. If does the shit fall through the cracks? Like you just, you need a responsive, ar a responsive architect that will make sure that, you know, your, your deal's a priority. They don't necessarily have to have cannabis, um, cannabis industry specific knowledge to do a oh, good okay. job. Okay. So yeah, sorry, a long answer to your, your question, but <laughs> no, it's okay. That's, yeah. that, that's good. So, you know, you got the, you know, executive, uh, you know, decision maker, maybe someone who is, is very task oriented, very detailed oriented, and mm -hmm. then you have an architect. So is there anybody else that, you know, a successful team in this business uh, needs to have? Make sure your business attorney knows um, how to structure everything mm -hmm. depending on, you know what the particulars of the business are you know if there's five partners mm -hmm. um, what's every partner is everyone on the same table in terms of the exit strategy um, make sure if they're looking for a quick exit like within a couple of years make sure everybody has you know make sure you have an attorney that's gonna put 83 B elections in everybody's hands mm -hmm. you know so that they don't get hit with a massive tax bill when they sell their, their company for two million dollars you know, so it's, um, yeah, make sure your business attorney knows this stuff and then it's just stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have a very filthy mouth. And so, uh, it's actually been really hard not to, uh, drop, drop a lot of bumps. But yeah. I'm All trying right. really hard day. <laughs> so, you know, you've been in this game for, for a little bit. So yeah. where, um, where do you see the trends going in this particular business? So oh, on the hemp side, I mean, the world is your oyster. I mean, there's really, like I was saying, there's cannabinoids with health benefits that we don't even know. They don't even have names and we don't even know what they, what they fucking do, you know, mm -hmm. but they come up in the lab test results and it's like, oh, what is that compound? 
you know, mm -hmm. maybe it, maybe it grows your, you know, eyelashes really long or something. You know, it's like they say they have that. No, they have. That. Do they really? They, they have stuff like that. Okay, I, I, see, believe, yeah. I believe so. Well, that's funny. you know, the the current um, the current uh, uh, medicine for glaucoma, and you know, there's other mm -hmm. uses for there's mm -hmm. other <laughs> medicine for glaucoma is right, to use, right. also to use uh, eyelash to grow your eyelashes. No way. Yeah, I, I need to try yeah. that. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. it's just like there's there's just so much opportunity at least on, and on the research and development side. People, a lot of people don't realize um, one of, um, this isn't a shameless bug at all, but one of my business partners, they, um, uh, they do research, they specialize in research and development tax credits. Mm -hmm. And the hemp and cannabis industry can benefit, pretty much every single one of the use types can benefit from utilizing an R&D tax credit specialist for all of these startup costs and all their operational costs moving forward because technically everything that we're doing right now, we're inventing an industry mm -hmm. where every single product is a new type of product. Hmm. And it's all research and development, brother. Like, yeah. and it's not, it doesn't matter what it means to the industry. It only matters what it means to the person who is producing that product. Hmm. I think the only, the only, you know, companies that probably wouldn't be able to benefit just like a, a cannabis marketing company or, you know, um, a, ca a cannabis attorney, you know, I'm not yeah. doing R and D. I'm just doing yeah. what I do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but a lot of companies don't realize it and they, they can literally like increase their bottom line probably 13 to 15 percent and wow. if, yeah if, if they know what they're fucking doing it's crazy yeah. and that's not that's without the the federal yeah. the federal even being being accounted for once the federal comes into play now you're looking at like 15 to 20 percent per business that's going to be able to like you know that's that's again money on the table right yeah cool that's that's there's some awesome insight so hopefully you know um uh, you help be helping a lot of more clients you know not on, obviously on the R and D side, but you know, past that, you know, how do you monetize the results uh, from these uh, from these ratios? So, um, sure. I know I know you have a particular background in real estate before you uh, went to law school, and you still have your broker's license. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that has helped you and your clients having you know both licenses yeah. in securing maybe some of the properties that yeah. they need to run these businesses. Well, me personally, I mean, when I went to law school. I, I did it because I was I was bored doing commercial transactions and like I, I needed I needed that kind of challenge. You know, it was a great challenge, you know, and it helped me grow. Um, it's actually, but going through law school and going you know into practice, I've always had like that deal maker mentality mm -hmm. since ever, and I've always felt that I have to earn. I need to make my clients more money than I'm charging them. You know, I, I really, uh, I feel like that, that sort of mentality has allowed me to, and allowed our, our law firm to be a lot more um, surgical in terms of how we operate within these new jurisdictions. The new jurisdiction comes out, what do we need to do? Okay, what are the zones? Okay, cool, we got all these zones. I can go immediately hit LoopNet, then I can go fucking aggregate every single cannabis property within that particular jurisdiction and then figure out, okay, which one's the best fit for this particular use type that we're going for. We're going for retail. Retail and lab testing facilities are really the only two use types that where, you know, your actual physical location matters. Mm. The rest of them, I mean, I can be like extracting oil up on top of Mount Shasta and, you know, I can still get it to every corner of the entire state and it wouldn't really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I can probably save a lot of money by operating in Nowheresville. You mm -hmm. know, the only difficulty though is if it's if it's an operation that requires um, a particular uh, scientific specialty, getting your talent and HR becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. So that's really the kind of the push and pull of the location. Um, but uh, now, you know, there's not a lot of attorneys that kind of go. Um, attack the business in that way and mm -hmm. um, because they, they don't have a real estate background. I mean, mm -hmm. even, you know, even, you know, Dave was in the mortgage side of things once upon a time, but he, um, he, he's been able to like see things more from like a broker perspective, mm -hmm. the way, you know, I just immediately go for these contracts. I immediately go for this and it's, it's actually been, um, it's been really advantageous for us. 
because we can get our clients results like that. Like, like as fast as I can snap my fingers and pick up my phone yeah. and, uh, and the cre- in the network that we've created on the real estate side within, there's only probably five to 10 brokers in the entire state that specialize real estate brokers that really actually specialize and know their shit within the cannabis space, like in a, mm-hmm. on a real level, like mm-hmm. can like, can talk, you know, talk, what do they call it? I don't know. <laughs> it's like kind of hiccupy. Know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, they know yeah, what they're yeah. talking about, like yeah. with within the various use use mm-hmm. types. Because like yeah. if you're talking about a property that would be you know good for lab testing, it might be vastly different than a cultivation stuff, yeah. right? So yeah. um yeah, that kind of stuff. But yeah. I mean most attorneys they're they're always willing to like go and put down a big fat price mm-hmm. on the cost of their services, but they can't fucking do that because yeah. they don't have that broker uh, broker mentality, I guess. Mm-hmm. They're not trying to make deals happen. They're really just like worried about bringing the clients in and then billing them, you know? So um, it's just made us a lot more efficient, a lot more effective um, because so much about cannabis and hemp is about, you know, the, the land uses and yeah. the zoning and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. It's cool. beneficial. Yeah, so this conversation has been really awesome. Um, if we, uh, so we're going to do some rapid fire questions. I know you answered this, these before, but I'm going to ask you again. All right. All so right. just answer the first thing that comes into your head. Uh, who right. do you look up to? I look up to Gavin Newsom. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, what's the, uh, uh, what's the best business book you've ever read? Best business book, I guess. The Art of War by Sun Tzu. <laughs> <laughs> what is uh, the best business advice you've ever received? Best business advice. I, I said one of them last time. What was it? I said, uh, always get the money up front. <laughs> and uh, I think I've said it a couple times on this conversation. <laughs> Never leave money on the table. Never leave money on the table. Okay. All and right. So if, uh, um, if, you cho- uh, if you were to do one thing over again, what would it be? I was going to read you anything... Uh, I think I would have started meditating a lot earlier because I'm, I'm kind of overworked lately. So <laughs> I, I need a break. Like literally I was scrambling five minutes before this uh, call to send you over my bio and like my picture and I uh, get prepped. So um, All right. I hope I hope I don't look like too much of a mess. <laughs> um, and uh, so you, uh, you lose everything. You only have your computer, your phone, and internet. How do you rebuild your business in 30 days? Um, an internet porn website. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, got, uh, vice legal, right? So I guess. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, we haven't gotten into porn yet, but, you know, that's, that's next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if we want uh, to learn more about you um, or we're in this space and we need help maybe getting licensed or need some advice, navigating the the compliance and the regulation uh where can we find you find me at vicelegal.com all right hey thanks right. To danny weiss for uh, sharing your time here it's been uh, so awesome to speak with you about this particular industry i know it's uh very new always changing every day so it's a uh, fresh uh, it's nice to have someone that's in the in on the boots uh, and on the ground working in every day and sharing with us that's right all right man dan i appreciate right. you thank all you right for this. thank you Take care. Have a good week. Bye.